Hi, everybody. I'm Lisa Carlin. Welcome to, welcome to our next uh, episode of Hey Doc, What's New in Plant-Based Medicine? Today, I'm really excited to have two of my favorite dietitians because certainly nutrition is a very important part of medicine. James and Dahlia Marin. They are both registered dietitians. Dahlia is a registered dietitian nutritionist. James is a registered, uh, a registered dietitian and an environmental nutritionist. So it is. Hi, everybody. Yeah, wonderful to have you guys. Welcome. Thanks for having us. This is, this is great. So my first question is always, um, I usually say, hey, doc, but since you're not doctors, I'm just simply going to say, what is new in plant-based medicine for registered dietitians? James? Yeah, so I'll start. I think I'm, as I'm an environmental nutritionist, I've been digging deep in the environment and the environment is the hot topic. We're talking about regenerative agriculture more. We're talking about exposures to certain environmental chemicals and how that affects your digestion, your nutrition, your overall health. So that is definitely what's new, what's hot. And we can definitely get into that for sure. I love that. And Dahlia, tell me what's new in plant-based medicine for registered dietitians. So for registered dietitians, we're showing that plant-based diets do help support optimal gut health and even in supporting disease, whether that's IBS, IBD, you're actually finding out that probiotics are not all that they were talked up to be and that's not necessarily the panacea of great gut health, but plants are. That is wonderful. I'm sure so many people are going to be very interested in hearing about what the scoop is on probiotics. And this is all evidence-based medicine, correct? This is not just your opinion. Always, always based on studies. We're always coming out and we're always reading the newest studies on gut health as that is what we specialize in. I love that. I love that. All right. So let's start our journey today by talking about your journey into a plant-based vegan lifestyle. Um, who wants to go first? James? Uh, sure. Yeah. I'll go first. I, I... You know, what brought you to this lifestyle? Yeah, I mean, I grew up a typical standard American diet. I ate tons of sugary cereal and just tons of meat and cheese. And I grew up in a Hispanic, very occult, um, you know, cultured household in terms of the like uh, Mexican American household. So tons of cheese, lots of like fatty Mexican food mixed with fatty American food. So I was a morbidly obese child and. As I was feeling just sicker and sicker, I had asthma, joint pain, uh, there was a turning point where I started exercising and I realized, wow, exercise makes me feel better. And then, oh, wow, I was learning about nutrition and oh, wow, the better my nutrition was, I would feel better. So it quickly connected that what I do to my body, what I put in my body affects my body, which is like, duh, right? So yeah, I mean, that was my journey. And then from there, you just start researching and researching, went to school and the undergrad tons of research. I met my beautiful wife, Dahlia, as we were in college together. And we both just connected on this thought of, wow, there's so much out there. There's so much peer reviewed evidence on plants being amazing for your body. So it was it was a no brainer. From there, we just continued. So now we're going on nine years being 100% plant based. So no animal products whatsoever. And we feel amazing. Our labs are amazing. And yeah, it's it's been a, a great journey for sure. Dahlia, tell us your tell us your story. I'm sure there's a lot of similarities because it looks like you did it together. But how is your story different? I think you have some personal personal health issues that that entered into this as well. So just as James, you know, I grew up uh, also very acculturated diet. My parents immigrated here from Egypt, so I was first generation American. We were very much infatuated with fast food and takeout food, and you know, I was a latchkey kid, so I would come home and kind of care for myself and cereal was a majority of my diet growing up. And very quickly I began gaining weight. I was sedentary and I would go for my yearly checkups. My physician would just tell me, you need to lose weight, you need to lose weight, you need to lose weight. And you know, it was obvious. However, um, it was one day that I had some lab work done and I, in one single day as a teenager was diagnosed with pre-diabetes polycystic ovarian syndrome, I had high cholesterol, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune thyroid condition, and just was not in great shape. Um, and so from there, I resolved to improve my own health. I had just started college, I was a psychology major and began my own health journey, began learning more about nutrition. And from there, decided to switch my major to nutrition, which school transferred, met James, and we then initiated that journey together. So when we kind of 
converged, we were both already on our own respective journeys, but together we really amplified that. And, you know, we were kind of thinking back of where it started. And I took a class on food ethics, I believe. And I was reading one of Michael Pollan's books in defense of food. And that led me back to wanting to rewatch Food Inc., which is one of his really powerful documentaries. And he exposes things like cases, concentrated animal feeding operations, and other things within the food system. And that somehow led us to reading the China study and feeling compelled by that research that was presented there and diving deep. So I really have improved my own health very, very significantly, feel incredibly inspired by the benefits of a plant-based diet when properly planned and had a healthy plant-based pregnancy and now have a healthy five and a half year old plant-based daughter. That's wonderful. And then look at this. <laughs> so you're, you got married. How long have you been married? Seven years. Seven years, yeah. And then you have a beautiful daughter. First, I want to talk about your your tagline here: "Heal yeah. with each meal." That is your trademarked ta uh, um, tagline. And and why is that important to you? How do, tell tell me about the importance of why you chose that. I think it's so powerful for people to understand that you have power in every single meal that you choose to make, choose to eat, choose to pick up. I think a lot of times, especially now in our society, we're looking for others to save us, right? Doctor, tell me what to do. Dietitian, tell me what to do. Give me this exact meal plan to follow. And I think people have really forgotten that they have so much power. And that fork, that spoon, that whatever utensil they're utilizing gives them the power to create healthier cells with each and every single meal. And really, uh, and if I can expand on that a little bit too, because mealtime is so important and we're, we're always looking at medications and supplements, but there's no medication, there's no supplement really, especially supplement that can give you the power of a healthy meal, right? When you're talking about the phytonutrients and the vitamins and the minerals and even the social aspect of mealtime, sitting down with your family, resting and digesting, being happy, being at peace limiting the stress. There's so many positives to a healthy meal time that you can't bottle that up and put it in a little capsule and expect it to do the same thing as actually sitting down and having a healthy meal with the people you love. So it's very, very powerful. Speaking about the people you love, tell, tell us about this one. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's our, our leader, really. She's, she's the power behind us for sure. Uh, that's Layla and she is, yeah, five and a half and she's fully plant-based. She's been plant-based even as a fetus. So Dahlia did a fully plant-based pregnancy and I'll let her talk about that. But she is living proof that you can have a healthy pregnancy, that you can, you know, do uh, everything uh, correct on a fully plant-based diet for sure. So you were plant-based before you even got pregnant. And how did that impact your pregnancy? What was your pregnancy like? I had a wonderful pregnancy. I didn't experience a lot of the pregnancy symptoms that a lot of my patients at that time, I worked with pregnant women at that time very frequently. And I was nervous. I saw woman after woman who had hyperemesis, who had hypertension and preeclampsia during pregnancy, gestational diabetes. And that was a concern of mine. I had previously been pre-diabetic. So I was very nervous about having gestational diabetes, but very healthy pregnancy, no health issues. I, you know, had a healthy full-term baby and I was only six. I can count them on a few fingers. So I loved, loved, loved being pregnant. It was wonderful. And what did you eat when you were pregnant? You know, I, I always say Layla was made out of whole food plant-based burritos. I had this burrito <laughs> egg, I had yeah. like food jags during my pregnancies and burritos are one of them. I had beans and potatoes in there and tons of veggies and salsa. And that was my jam for like a whole trimester at least. Um, I would eat lots of frozen berries. Initially I was craving popsicles and then realized I'm not going to eat that much sugar every day. So I would eat frozen berries and just a variety of regular foods. I didn't really have any food aversions and continued to consume a really wide variety of different foods, knowing that that was going to set her up for success. That was going to prime my body for a healthy delivery. And that was exposing her to a variety of flavors through breast milk. You were. So tell us as registered dietitians, what does the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics say about being pregnant and following a plant-based diet? Are there any concerns? 
The, yeah. There are no concerns. You're just doing it properly, right? I mean, just as as with anything, I mean, you have to do it in the correct manner. And so you have to make sure you're getting in all your healthy fats, your healthy amino acids, and, and of course, your fiber and healthy carbohydrates, your vitamins and minerals. So yeah, but the, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics approves a, a, a fully plant-based or partially plant-based diet when pregnant and even beyond for children. So it's, yeah. yeah statement is that properly planned plant-based diets are appropriate at any age and stage from childhood, pregnancy, elderly, any age and stage, as long as it's appropriately planned, like James was saying. So not a vegan diet, but an appropriately planned plant-based diet. Yes. Right. So an example is Dahlia could have easily ate chips and salsa as a whole meal, right? Or ate a lot of processed food and just had ice cream as one of her meals. And there's so many pregnant women that we've seen as, as professionals and just in our personal life who go on really unhealthy food jags where they're just eating very limited nutrients, eating the mono meals of certain foods, and that is not giving you a diverse array of, pro of nutrients, right? So that's not good. <laughs> so you're saying that a vegan diet can either be healthy or not healthy. But exactly. a plant-based diet is a subset of a vegan diet. And that would be if it includes all the food groups, all the different, so not macronutrients, right? Can you talk a little bit about macronutrients versus food groups? Who wants to tackle that? Yeah. I mean, so when you say like macronutrients, there are the macronutrients you're talking about like fat, carbohydrates, protein, right? So yeah, I mean, everyone, everyone, or a lot of people are, Pretty, very concerned with their macros, right? And especially when you're getting more in the fitness side of things, you're like, what are your macros? How much protein are you getting? Especially in most uh, developed nations, like protein, protein, protein. Um, but really when you're talking about food groups, that can even be confusing as well, because if you're looking at the American food groups, dairies in there, right? Dairies, its own little, little group. Where then you have Canada who came out and said, look, we've we looked at the research and dairy really has no place in our in our food pyramid or food plate, right? According to Canada. So it's it's very biased depending who you're talking to. And you ask, what are the food groups? Well, the USDA will say one thing, Canada will say another thing, probably the, the UAE will say something different. So it's odd to be like, well, all of these nations have access to the same research. Why are they coming to different conclusions? And that's where food groups can be altered based on where the money is coming from. And so there is quite a bit of money being passed around and not everything is always based in science. So, but when you're talking, when you're talking about macros and micronutrients though, macros are solid. You'll get your macros in a fully plant-based diet and you'll get your micronutrients like vitamins, minerals, and phytonutrients. All of that will be found in a fully plant-based diet. So should you, okay, go ahead, Dad. go ahead, Diet. Yeah. Canada actually, when they came out with their guidelines, they said that they would not include any industry funded studies. And that is how they concluded that dairy should not have a place in their guidelines, which I love. So like Jane said, you always want to ask who funded this study, because you really could find a study saying anything is good for you. You could find a study that says heroin is good for you, probably, right? Depending right. on who funded it. Um, there are so many you know, studies out there, but I love that they said, no, we will remove any bias. We are not including any industry funded data. And then that's where they kind of took those macronutrients, put them in their own respective food groups, and also considered micronutrients in there as well. And this is really important, Lisa. I want to just say this happens a lot in, in egg studies as well. So this is where you'll hear the headline, uh, headline, eat eggs, eggs are really good for you. And then the next day you're hearing eggs are bad, don't eat eggs. And so this is a manipulation of statistics, right? If you, if you have a person or a group of people eating two eggs a day and you put them against the people eating as much cheese and meat as you want, you can say eggs help lower cholesterol, right? Because that's true. You have one group eating tons of cholesterol. You have one group eating eggs, but it's less cholesterol. Therefore, those people eating eggs had lower cholesterol. But it all depends on the context, right? Or who you're comparing to. Exactly. So if you're comparing either of those groups, the egg eating group or the meat and cheese eating group to a whole food plant-based group, what would you find out? Oh, then there's, there's no competition whatsoever. We're finding that across the board, whether it's epidemiological studies or crossover studies, that those on a, on a primarily or fully plant-based diet, they're having the healthiest cholesterol numbers. They're having even healthier outcomes when it comes to mortality, which is saying they're less likely to die from a heart attack, right? 
So this is where context matters. And it's unfortunate we have, you know, some players who are putting out these research studies just confused, right? So we have a saying too, confusion creates illusion. And that's what they want. They want this confusion. So we keep kind of doing the wrong thing. I think it's very interesting. Michael Greger did a couple of nutrition facts videos about eggs and he showed that the egg industry, because they take money from the USDA, they can't promote anything that is particularly unhealthy or they'll lose their funding so that all of their taglines, eggs, it's what's for breakfast, eggs, the incredible edible egg really say nothing about the nutrition of the eggs. But if they say they're high in protein, they're a good source of nutrition. They can't say that because they'll lose their funding. I think that's quite interesting. So we're not promoting eggs, but you're saying when you compare just eggs to meat and dairy, then you're looking at lower cholesterols, but that's still not going to put you in the healthy range, correct? Correct. Yeah. So let's move, let's move along. You have now uh, co-founded, I understand you've co-founded the Institute of Plant-Based Medicine in Newport. Who are your other co-founders? Oh yeah. So we have the amazing Dr. Andrew Sadegi, who's the president and CEO. She's the, the original founder for sure. She is amazing gastroenterologist in Newport Beach, California. Uh, we have uh, amazing Dr. Micah Yu, who's a rheumatologist, a doc, Dr. Melissa Mandala, who's a family practice physician. Unlike, I, I really have to talk up Dr. Mandala. She's unlike any other primary care physician you've ever seen. She meditates with her patients. She spends tons of time with her patients. She even prays with her patients if that's, you know, that's what you're into. She's very uh, inclusive and inviting, amazing. We have Dr. Vanessa Mendez, who's another IBD plant-based IBD specialist. And we have uh, Dr. Danielle Bellardo, who's a preventative cardiologist. So we have quite an amazing group with different perspectives and we're definitely getting a, a big picture view of what we can do to just better the health and outcomes of our community. Now, yeah. how much time, I was gonna say, how much time does each doctor spend with their patients? Because you are, um, uh, you are non-Medicare, you are not Medicare providers. So you're not uh, pigeonholed into that very short amount of time that doctors get have with their patients. What's the average length of time that you spend with your patients? And can you speak for the other physicians at IOPBM as well? Yeah, for sure. I, I would say on average, we're spending at least an hour with our patients in a, in a visit. And, um, you know, look, some of our some of our providers do still take PPO insurance and Medicare. So we are we are still taking that, but a majority do not. And that is because we're looking at what is the best care for our patients? What is what, what can we do to give our patients the very, very best? And unfortunately, very similar to the infrastructure we've set in our food systems and in our farming systems, our healthcare system is in dire need of an overhaul. So when you're, when you're getting that insurance, you're really getting gypped in many ways. You're getting gypped on time with the doctor, you're getting gypped on the best care and the best knowledge, you're getting gypped with all the co-pays, and having to pay high deductibles. So really at the end of it, you're coming out most of the time sicker than when you came in. So we really have to ask, is this a healthcare model or like we've heard, you know, sick care model, or it's just kind of a really inefficient way to do things. And many people spend hundreds, if not thousands of dollars every month on this insurance. So we're gonna be educating heavily on this. We're really gonna go for it in terms of educating, what are you doing with your money you know, where's your money going? Do you want it to go to be healthy and, and really speak with providers who are on the forefront of research and just proper care? Or do you want it to just go in the traditional model and just be another cog in the machine? It's it's really, really eye-opening when you dig deeper into the insurance model and see, oh my gosh, it's so corrupt and it's so inefficient. So that's why we're getting out of it. <laughs> and you, oh, go ahead, Diane. To give a shout out to our RDs that James hasn't mentioned on our team. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. several other also telemedicine providers. We're bringing on a plant-based yes. OBGYN. We're bringing on another plant-based primary care physician, Dr. Judy Bringman. We have Dr. Natalie Crawford. So we are bringing on physicians from throughout the country. Uh, Dr. Arthi Sungadu, I think he's a prenatal team. She's an endocrinologist, and then we have some incredible RDs. And that is what really, really excites us about IOPBM. We're really trying to raise awareness and bring that platform back to that fish and registered dietitian relationship. So James is 
Yeah. Sorry, my little. I'm I'm here at the office right now, and and actually, I'm probably gonna have to get off in one minute just because we're so busy here. But um, All right, let's just let's just jump down to your slide right now before okay. you just jump ahead. <laughs> let's talk about non toxic home cleaning because that's one one area that I wanted to address. Yeah. So why is this important? So this is important for many reasons. I think when we're talking, if we go back to the pediatric population with us having a young child, when you look at children under the age of five, what are they doing? They're all over the floor. Our daughter is still five and a half and she's pretending she's a caterpillar on the floor. She's rolling all over the couch or she's just everywhere in the house, right? So when you're cleaning with what we call VOCs, right? Volatile organic compounds, or you're cleaning with compounds that are antimicrobial, right? Or they kill 99.9% .9 of bacteria. You have to remember we are mainly, we are 99.9% .9 microbes. We are 90% we are bacteria. So if a chemical is killing life, we are life, correct? So there's, there's tons of research coming out to show that a lot of these household chemicals are, are one, not even really tested, and two, are showing to have negative health outcomes, especially for children. So we're talking about an increased risk of asthma and upper respiratory issues, um, bronchial issues, headaches, you know, um, skin breakouts, and and yeah, so it's it's really quite concerning. So when looking at that, we've been doing this for a while. We had to go, well, what's what's the healthiest thing we can do for our family? And it was easy switches. It's saying, well, let's clean with baking soda instead of a bleach, right? Let's clean with vinegar instead of a really, you know, noxious, what, fabuloso or some of these chemicals you find at a, at a common store. On top of that, a lot of these cleaners will have artificial dyes and colors. They can be contaminated with heavy metals. They're typically stored in what, a plastic bottle. And you have to think, where where's that cleaner coming from? Well, it's usually manufactured overseas. So the bottle sits in huge crates as it goes over the ocean for huge amounts of time. It's baked in the sun. So as it's sitting in that plastic bottle, even the plastic starts to leach bisphenol compounds into the chemical mixture. And now you're getting a who knows what in terms of what's in that actual chemical mixture of active ingredients, inactive ingredients, the plastic, and God knows what other you know cross-contamination has occurred. And then we spray that all over our house. So these are just little things we really haven't looked at. These are little things that more and more research is coming out on because a lot of people are just waking up and going, wow, this little spray I use on my floor could have a big impact because you're using it almost every day and you're exposing your family to it every single day. So that that's my little spiel on that. <laughs> and, and you put this information on your on your social media. So if people want more information, they should check out your social media. And I do have a ticker going with everybody's yeah. social media. So if you can't get you, get it the first round, just keep watching for the ticker, and you'll see all the social media handles, which I think is really important. And yeah. you can find you and Dahlia at MarriedToHealth.com. All yeah. right, well, thank you. We're going to continue the show until eleven o'clock. Yeah specific time, but I want to thank you so much for being with us today. And is oh, there yeah. anything else you'd like to say that we didn't cover that you'd like to mention? Oh, there's tons more guys. I mean, uh, yeah, definitely sign up for our newsletter. You can do both newsletters, whether it's married to health.com or IOPBM.com. Uh, we're going to be having great events. I'm going to be doing a debate at the end of the month on organic farming and regenerative farming and going into our food and our food systems. Who are you so debating? Uh, it's going to be with uh, Dr. Bellardo and another doctor. So they're kind of anti-organic and I am for organic with, uh, we're going to be on with the chief operating officer of the Rodale Institute. And we're going to just be having a, a really healthy discussion on organic and farming and really kind of get into Wow, the let's talk more about that. Maybe we can yeah. cover it. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Well, and, and, and share, we'll, we'll talk more about that when, you're, okay. when your show is over. But that's very interesting. That really has my attention. I love that. Yeah. So right. well, thank you, James. Thank you, guys. So Dahlia will take over. You're in good hands, and she's amazing, and that's why I love her. Married her. <laughs> <laughs> All, All right. right. Well, say hi, hi everybody. To I O P P M. All well, right. Hi. Bye. Okay. So here we are. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit, and then we're going to do a cooking demonstration, and um, and I've got so let's see if I've got any any comments. Um, Paige Parsons Roche says we have the power to create healthier cells. What do you think about that? Absolutely. I'm a firm believer in that. 
firm, firm, firm believer in that. We have the power to change our gut health. We know that our gut health modulates our immune cells to a high degree, so we really do. And, and Sarah Siegel says, we must all share preventative measures. Plant-based diets must be offered to all patients. Let, why don't you tell me about your frustration, if any, with the healthcare community that doesn't make this front and center. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and you know, I'll share a little bit of my experience actually in school and even, I used to work inpatient. I used to work in the hospital as well. And so much frustration there where Nutrition, when taught to registered dietitians traditionally in school, it's very compartmentalized. So what we're talking about is those food groups. We're talking about macronutrients. We're saying, okay, a diabetic needs to carb count. Somebody with hyperlipidemia needs to reduce their fat intake. There is not much emphasis put on, one, how to actually prepare the meals, how to actually put together a healthful meal, the importance of micronutrients, creating healthy cells, so I think registered dietitians really come out into the world a little bit underprepared. At least I can say that for myself, where, you know, I was like, okay, well, where are my diabetics? I can carb count with them. And, you know, not really considering the aspect of insulin resistance, not really considering the aspect of the part that saturated fats had to play upon blood sugar. You know, autoimmune disease wasn't really spoken about to it a large extent, gut health was not really mentioned. So we got this very compartmentalized, really picture of nutrition. And I don't think it gave us a whole picture. And then you go out into the world, predominantly you're gonna find registered dietitians working inpatient in hospitals. Mm -hmm. Although that's not the only place you will find us, you will find us at other places like outpatient clinics, uh, with women, infants, and children. You can find us at sports dietitians, renal clinics, but there are several RDs employed by hospitals. And again, that's what's practiced at the hospital. It's very guideline based. And, you know, if somebody has a wound that won't heal, it's X amount of protein. So they need double insure if they, you know, need the extra protein or, you know, double meat portions or double this and double that. It's not a focus on quality of food. It's very focused on quantity. So tell, tell our audience about the difference between a nutritionist and a registered dietitian or a registered dietitian nutritionist, because it's very confusing to people who are outside of this field. Yes, and now you have all kinds of people like a certified nutritionists, you have uh, health coaches, and you know you have all these different myriad of people who I love it. They're enthusiastic about health. I'm all for it, and I've met some incredible certified nutrition specialists and wonderful health coaches. And while I appreciate that others are out there promoting health and promoting nutrition, I do very often see that there is a lack of understanding as a whole of science, anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, and how it all really combines in our bodies and works together. You know, that's why you can't just tell people, oh, yeah, you know, just eat this and eat apples and eat that and that. There's a, a great complexity and an individuality about nutrition, and it's that's why there is a science of nutrition. So I think sometimes with best intentions, with just that slight lack of understanding of the science of nutrition, um, you know, sometimes those recommendations may fall short or may lead somebody astray or may lead them to a place where they might become deficient in something or, right. they, you know, might have caused unintentional harm. So a registered dietitian has either a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a PhD, in either nutrition science, human nutrition and food science with an emphasis on dietetics. Um, and then we go on and we are required to complete an internship. They're highly, highly competitive. I know now the numbers have changed a little bit. When James and I graduated, it was estimated that only one in every 50 graduates would ever get into an internship. So they're highly competitive, just like a residency for physicians. And that is 2000 supervised practice hours. You then sit to take your registered dietitian exam where you're either licensed or you know registered and then you are re required to maintain continuing education units or continuing medical education just like a physician just like a nurse practitioner just like a physician's assistant so exactly. there is a lot of checks there are a lot of checks and balances yeah. for rds and not necessarily for nutritionists because in california at least anyone can say they're a nutritionist my daughter, my five-year-old is a nutritionist, and she can legally say that because there isn't licensure for registered dietitians. So I think it's really important to highlight registered dietitians as part of a care team because we speak that science language. And the other thing is reimbursement. 
So reimbursement is available if you're licensed. If you're not a licensed dietitian or nutritionist or health coach, there are no licensed health coaches. You can't be reimbursed. So for, for individuals to be, it's like going to a doctor that doesn't have a license. It's like, oh, I'm a doctor. Well, you know, you have to do certain things to become a doctor and get a license. Registered dietitians have a license. And just like registered nurses have a license. And that's the, and, and that's the minimal end, uh, uh, stage of entry. Mm-hmm. which I think is really important. We're required to uphold very high standards. So that's not always translated into these other fields like nutritionists and uh, yeah. certified nutritionists and things like that. All right, let's talk about calcium because everybody says if you're not eating, I mean, a lot of uneducated people, I should say, not everybody says, if you're not getting uh, consuming dairy products, where do you get your calcium? Can you talk a little bit about this slide? Yes, absolutely. And this can be found on our social media and our handles are below. So. Calcium can be abundantly found in a plant-based diet if you are consuming mostly whole plant foods. It's very nice also that many plant foods are fortified. So you can purchase fortified tofu, you can purchase fortified plant milks, and that is where you're going to acquire your calcium. You know, a lot of times we don't realize that a lot of dairy milk is also fortified with the calcium and vitamin D that they so tout that they're rich in. So um, this can either come from your whole plant foods, like your Beans. Beans are a wonderful source of calcium, as are grains. This can come from other plant foods, like I mentioned, tofu and fortified plant milk. Or if you'd like to supplement, there are some really wonderful plant-based calcium supplements on the market that come mainly from algae and seaweed. So as long as one is ensuring that they're either consuming those whole plant foods or they're appropriately supplementing, if I always give the example to my patients, if you're going for one of those cleaner milks, that doesn't have any emulsifiers or additives in it, oftentimes they do not have calcium fortification either. So you can self-fortify, and that's what we do here in our colony. I, and you know, I don't work for this brand or anything, but this is, for example, what we use. We utilize these calcium capsules, and when we make our own plant milk, we'll open up the capsules, pour them in there, and then we're acquiring a majority of our calcium recommendations. But what if you're just eating, um, you know, dark leafy greens? I mean, the sources, the, the the sources of of calcium that are on your list. So you have mustard greens. People may not be eating that as much, but they'll eat edamame, which is tofu, which is soybeans, and they'll and and dark leafy green vegetables are are high in calcium, as um, almond butter and tempeh, and certainly the fortified plant milk. So if someone's not, if you're making their milks, where what else would you recommend for a child? Would you be able to get enough calcium from the food alone without the supplement? You know, I always recommend for children, plant-based children especially, to offer fortified foods because their diets are very variable. You know, some days they eat a lot. Other days they're very peckish and they eat a very small amount. So because unlike an adult, you know, we're more disciplined, we can be more consistent in our behaviors. I do recommend supplementing for plant-based children because you do not want them to fall short. They're in a very rapid growth stage and they're building up their gut microbiome. And that's something that's so important as well. Calcium is an important part also of the gut microbiome. And so we we do recommend and supplementing for plant-based children. And that way you're ensuring they're getting their baseline and whatever they're gleaning whole foods on top of that is an added bonus. And how much do you, how much do you fortify with? How much calcium do you fortify it with? I usually fortify about 50% of our calcium for myself and for James. For Layla, I'll usually fortify it with about 75% of her recommendation. So, you know, for us, I'll fortify about 800 um, micrograms per day and um, for Layla or milligrams rather. For Layla, I'll fortify with about 500 milligrams per day. Okay. All right. Let's talk about probiotics. You started to, to uh, the show by talking about some new information on probiotics. Mm-hmm. And um, these are actually prebiotic foods. These are the foods. So let's start, let's start, start with a discussion about prebiotics and then go into probiotics. Yes. I think prebiotics are an unsung hero in our diets. And thankfully, in a plant-based diet, prebiotics are abundant. And a lot of people don't realize what prebiotics are. They're actually food for the probiotics. For years, I would say about a decade now, we've been obsessed with probiotics. Take your probiotic supplements. I'm now seeing weird probiotic foods. We love, love, love going to Natural Products Expo. It's our favorite trade show. And this last year, probiotic fortified foods were all the rage. I saw probiotic chips and you know probiotic this and that, probiotic junk food, which really you're not going to glean much benefit. But we oftentimes don't talk about prebiotics. So Probiotics, one, 
A recent meta-analysis has come out and reviewed probiotics and actually found that more often than not, probiotics are more likely to cause things like bloating, brain fog, and fatigue. The American College of Gastroenterology has come out with their official statement on probiotics and have found that there are only very certain conditions that necessitate them. And they're very dire conditions. So prevention of C. difficile, a very se severe infection, you know, pouchitis, necrotizing enterocolitis in infants. So not your average person who just wants to eat an unhealthy diet and then take probiotics and think that's kind of their end all be all. So probiotics, even if you do take them, they are very transient. So they're not going to necessarily move in and take up residence in the gut. You need to really encourage them and enhance the environment so they'll stay there. So you need to feed them, right? They're going to get hangry. They're going to leave if you don't feed them. Probiotics are best fed with prebiotic fibers. So as you saw there in that slide, you're going to find prebiotic fibers in a lot of different foods. Garlic and onions, for example, you see leeks, which is kind of a cousin of garlic and onion. Sweet potato, which I'm going to be cooking with today. Beans. So eat your legumes, and we'll talk about if they bloat you, what you can do. Chia seeds, beets, dandelion, um, artichoke, Jerusalem artichoke. There are so many amazing prebiotics. But if you can't remember them all, just remember to eat fiber, and your probiotics will love them, ferment them, and be more likely to move in because they're going to be happy with this new home that you're giving them. Okay, let's talk about legume digestion because a lot of people will say, you know, I love beans, but they don't love me. And what they're talking about is the thing we don't like to discuss in public, that's flatulence, also known as gas. So what do you say to people who have been eating a standard American diet and decide they want to make a switch to whole food plant-based? How quickly can they make that, that transition? And what should they be eating? Let's talk about this slide, legume dig digestion, for a moment. I love, love, love this question. And this is a common question that I get. And, you know, I always tell my patients, my patients are always very bashful when I ask about bowel movements and gas and bloating. And I say, I want to know as much as how it's coming out as how it's going in. So this is one of my topics. I'm talking about this on the daily. But with legumes, you're absolutely correct. That's one of the biggest comments that I get. Oh, I can't eat beans. Beans bloat me. And I often ask, what types of beans are you consuming? Black beans, pinto beans, kidney beans. Well, if we see on the legume digestion spectrum, those happen to be some of the absolute highest in fiber. So if you're going from a moderate or very low fiber diet, which is very typical of the standard American diet, the average American gets anywhere from five to 12 grams of fiber in an average day. So if you're going from eating very little fiber, <clears throat> which is about the size of one serving of beans, you know, if you're going from very little to no fiber to eating a bunch of beans and salads and kale and you know all these fiber rich foods, your microbes are not ready for that transition. And so you want to really ease them into it. In history, our guts have had proper time to transition the diet. You know, if you wanted to go from being an Alaskan Inuit consuming mainly, you know, whale blubber to going to the African Sahara and consuming a mainly plant-based diet, that would have taken you quite some time to make that transition, either on foot or by boat or whatever means you're going to utilize to travel. So your microbes acclimated along the journey as your food slowly changed. Now you can go to Whole Foods and one day you're vegan, the next day you're keto, then you're carnivore, then you're paleo. Your microbes get overwhelmed and they're confused. So you do want to encourage them to flourish and ease them into that transition. And that's why I created, I scoured through several studies and I accumulated this list of the quantity of fiber and other compounds like oxalates and lectins, which I'd love to talk about because they get a bad name. But those are just some compounds that are found in food. They're a natural protective compound. They can be harder to digest if you have poor gut health, but they actually are antioxidants. So I made this list and it takes you through kind of the transition that you're going to see in the evolution of low to moderate to high fiber legumes. I always take my patients through that. And I'll say, if you can't do a, a cup of kidney beans now, don't despair. Don't write them off. We will work our way up there. So we'll start with the lower fiber legumes. We'll start with green peas. Most people do well with those. They might not do well with pea protein isolate. That can cause gastrointestinal discomfort. But green peas, people do really well with. Soybeans or edamame. And then let's try black-eyed peas. And I'll have them spend a week or so with each bean until they're moving on to the next. And they often find if they're really following that and they're slowly increasing the amount of fiber and the type of bean and the quantities they're eating, 
they eventually make their way to the end and they do great. That's wonderful. And you do that with a program called Your Gut Connection. Yes. So Can we talk a little, just a little bit about that before we start our food demo. Sure. Absolutely. No, it'll be a quick demo. So Dr. Sadegi was our original partner in the practice. We were just three and now we are 15. So we recognized we were seeing more and more cases of IBS and a particular type of IBS called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. This is when bacteria or microbes, it could be fungus or other microbes from the colon, the large intestine, where we have all an abundance, a lot of microbes, they creep up to the small intestine where we don't have a lot of microbes, but we have a lot of undigested, unabsorbed food, and they start fermenting. They're doing their right job in the wrong place. So they start fermenting all this fiber, and typical symptoms are waking up with a flat stomach, feeling great in the morning, right when my patients start eating and drinking, they become more and more bloated throughout the day until they literally will send me pictures. They look and feel bloated, uh, pregnant by the end of the day. So we wanted to come up with an alternative method to help them with their SIBO. Right now, the standard in the industry is using a low FODMAP diet. So this is a basically low fermentable diet. So low fermentable oligosaccharides, monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polyols. Basically, they tell you if fiber bloats you because of SIBO, don't eat fiber. I don't agree with that. <laughs> you know, we never want to cut fiber out of the diet. We know that it's, it can give you temporary alleviation of symptoms, but it is not a long-term solution. We would have patients come to us and cry and say, I've been low FODMAP for five years, and now I can only eat five different foods. I can't eat fiber. Anytime I try, I can't tolerate it. Oh, so God. we created a program that's six phases. And we, one, help emphasize we need to figure out why you got SIBO in the first place and, re and really rectify that and make sure that you never get it again. We need to get rid of the SIBO because once it's there, we need to get it out. And then we need to re-tolerate your microbes to fiber. So it's a reverse elimination program. And we do practice this with our patients at IOPVM where we take them through the six phases of adding more and more foods. So phase one, you're basically just having relief. You're doing all cooked foods throughout the entire program and nothing raw because raw has higher amounts of fiber that need breaking down from your microbes. We're going to give them a little bit of a break. So we're doing all cooked foods or frozen foods. Love frozen foods. And I'll talk about this a little bit more. When you freeze fiber, it the ice crystals expand and it ruptures the cellulose fiber. That is why if you freeze something and then thaw it, it's mushy, right? You broke apart the fiber. You're never going to be able to freeze a cucumber and unfreeze it and thaw it. And it's going to be crunchy cucumber. It's soft now because you broke apart the fiber. That's a good sign for the gut. So we focus on that in the first phase and then little by little start adding things throughout the other phases, like simple grains. Then we start with legumes. Then we'll do a little bit of, of a higher amount of whole food fat. Then we'll do whole grains, fermented food, and see so, where So are. where is this, your gut connection, um, gut soothing foe, where does that come in the various phases? So this one is phase two. So right in the beginning, we're initiating things like this. And so when I work with my clients one-on-one, -on -one, I provide them with these recipes, and you're able to kind of go through the stages. So this is phase two. And again, it's not something like, an elemental diet that's sometimes used for SIBO, where you're basically only drinking um, elemental nutrients. You're not having solid food. We do not believe in that. We know that long term, that is going to have less favorable yeah. outcomes for the gut. How about this? What phase is this one in? So these are kale chips. This is coming in, I believe, in phase four. So this is phase four because there is a little bit of a cashew coating on there. So, like I said, phase four, you're doing higher amounts of fat. Okay. And how about this one? So this is our aloe berry smoothie. This is phase one. And what is the purpose of the aloe? So aloe, much like the okra, which I'm going to be demonstrating in today's recipe, is very high in soluble fiber, and it contains something called mucilage. So it's a demulcent that helps kind of coat the mucus layer that protects our gut lining through and through. So aloe is a powerful demulcent. It contains that mucilage. Our microbes love it. And it ensures that our microbes are not consuming our own mucus layer and then leading us to things like intestinal permeability. So aloe, I love. Okra, I love. And I'm going to be talking about the benefits of that. I have one more over here that this is from your gut connection. This looks like a delicious tea. I've never had this before. So this is a wonderful tea. And I usually recommend this to my gut patients to sip on throughout the day. It's a carminative tea. 
Carminative herbs are those that help kind of soothe the stomach and can even help enhance motility or movement throughout the gut, which we oftentimes find is slow in SIBO. So we usually use a variety of different teas, and I'll show you a couple. If you don't have these loose in your home, um, caraway, fennel, chamomile, you can use bagged teas. I have a couple brands that I really love. Traditional Medicinals is one of my favorite, and I'll recommend to my patients you know, if you don't have loose fennel, use their fennel. Or Belly Comfort has fennel and chamomile and ginger in it. Um, you know, you can use chamomile tea. So you can use these different blends and really help kind of alleviate your symptoms while we're figuring out what's going on at a root cause level. All right. Well, we're going to have a food demo, and this is what we're going to make. And I will post this uh, to the so our social media site so people can have a copy of the directions. Tell us why you cho why you chose this. So I chose this recipe, my okra and yam hash from the program, because I think okra is an unsung hero. I think if more people consumed okra, we would have much better gut health. Again, it has great soluble and insoluble fiber. It helps kind of repair the lining of the gut if you're eating it in moderate amounts. And I like to kind of show people things that are atypical, right? Everybody knows how to make a smoothie and a salad and oats and you know overnight oats. And I like to show people that the best thing to do for your gut is initiate variety. We found in a study that came out in 2019, diversity is king for the gut microbiome. A wonderful study out of the University of San Diego found that those who consumed at least 30 different plants a week, so different types of fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, beans, legumes, had the most optimal gut health. So I always say, you know, if you tolerate a food well, maybe you are one of those people who says, I can only eat a few different types of food. If you tolerate a food well, then try eating its cousin. I know that sounds so weird, but if you're good with white potatoes or yams, uh, you know, orange yams, then try other types. So that is why I'm going to show you guys today two different types of yams and sweet potatoes and okra, two of my favorite good gut superstars. I also posted this recipe on Married to Health and Dahlia Marin RDN. So if anybody wants to make it, you have the recipes there. Okay, let's switch cameras to the cooking camera. So I'm going to do this one. And uh, let's see, I'll take this one off and this one off. Oops, no, what did I do? Here. Um, uh, I can take this one off. There we go. Okay, there we go. So I have all my ingredients here. I have my wonderful intern who is assisting me this morning. And as you see, very simplistic ingredients. I don't have 20 different things. So Creating healthy, good gut meals does not have to be overly complicated. You can do so with just a few simple ingredients, but I do encourage that variety. So if you have a local farmer's market, I recommend frequenting there. You're going to get a little bit higher nutrient density, and you are going to get the freshest, most local ingredients that are seasonal. So for this recipe, we actually are utilizing a frozen food. Like I mentioned, frozen fiber is more gut friendly if you are having symptoms of IBS or SIBO or gas or bloating. So I purchased frozen okra, it's already pre-cut, and this is what it looks like if you've never seen okra before. There are these little pods and they have these little seeds inside. Okra is something I actually grew up eating, it's a typical Mediterranean food, but I absolutely love introducing it to my patients and love that it's widely available. This is from Whole Foods, but you can find it at many different stores. And then I use two different types of potatoes. So this is a Japanese sweet potato. As you see, it has this beautiful pink, almost purple outside and a white inside. If you're doing well with potatoes and you're looking for more variety in your diet, start adding different types within the same family. This is a Hannah yam. It's a bit brown, tan on the outside, white on the inside. So this is the base of the recipe as well as garlic and onion. And I know I'm gonna get comments of, on a low FODMAP diet, you're not supposed to eat garlic and onions, they're fermentable. That is true. So what I found with a lot of my patients is, although they may not tolerate some FODMAPs, it's not necessary to cut out all FODMAPs. If you don't tolerate garlic and onions for now, and I always like to recommend, remind yourself of that word for now, because this is not a forever restriction, then intend to eat other foods within the same family. If somebody is not doing well with onions and garlic, try eating leeks and shallots. Try eating green onion. I find oftentimes my patients do perfectly fine with those. They're often surprised and they're happy to hear that their food can taste good again with these things. So try garlic and onion if you do well with it. If not, sub these out. Leeks, shallots, green onion. 
we already had pre-chopped the garlic and onion, and I actually got started while we were speaking because I know these need a little bit of extra time. So what I did in my pot, my pan, and I'm using a ceramic coated pan. It's from Extrema Cookware because I always get these questions. Um, I sauteed the garlic and onion, and here with the garlic and onion, I added in the chopped up potatoes. So again, I have my Hana yam, I have my Japanese sweet potato, and I simply added it to my pan. And the next thing that I'll be adding in is some spice. So we do have just very simple salt and pepper. If you are somebody who does not consume salt, you can omit it. It's completely up to you. And I am sauteing in vegetable broth. As much as I would love to make my own vegetable broth, I don't always have the time. So I used a pre-made, just regular organic, low sodium vegetable broth. Again, if you're somebody who omits salt, you do not need to include the salt, but I like to add just a little bit for flavor. So I'm going to season them and then it's ready for the next ingredient, which is going to be the okra. I love, love, love having people eat okra and they're always really surprised like, oh, it got a little slimy, which is great. That is a good sign. That slime is a good part of the food. So as I had mentioned, that helps kind of create this demulcent effect. It creates this healthy mucus that you need to line your intestines. And this is similar to if you've ever eaten cactus leaves or nopales, if you've ever had aloe, you notice that there is that aspect of goo or slime with them. So okra does much of the same thing when you start to saute it. The little seeds, the pods inside, will release a little bit of that, as will the actual plant itself. And so I'm just going to let this saute for a minute. And you don't need to cook the okra very long because the fiber got so broken down when it was frozen. It really just needs to be reheated, rethermed, and then we'll be ready to serve some up. So my potatoes are already pre-cooked and I will show you guys what this looks like. All in all, from start to finish, this dish takes about 25 minutes. And what I recommend to my gut patients is to cook in bulk. You don't wanna be cooking every single day. So prepare a large batch and then have some throughout the entire week so you're not cooking separate things every single day. And these are recipes in the program that can be acceptable for your entire family. So I really am a proponent for preventing gut issues and initiating good gut health habits for kids. So introduce these things to your kids, have them eat the same thing. So I really wanna show you guys this goo that it kind of let out. I wanna show you how it looks and show you how yummy it can be. And that was it. So I'm going to bring it up to the camera. So you can see this is the okra. And you can kind of see that little goo, that soluble fiber coming off of the okra. And sweet potato. And it's really yummy. And it kind of makes its own sauce. Yeah, absolutely. That is wonderful. Well, we are just right on time. Let me see if there's any questions. We have a bunch of comments. Um, Paige says these are, are really inspiring stories and that we should heal with each meal. She likes that. And um, let's see, I'm looking for questions. People are making comments. Great show uh, using preventive me measures um, to prevent health issues. But what I'd like to ask you is um, there'll be uh, questions and comments yes. during the next couple of days on our Facebook and on um on uh, YouTube and, and Twitter. So if you could monitor that and just answer them as they come along, that would be great. Absolutely, we would love to. So I encourage um, our listeners, if they are watching it now live or if they're gonna watch it sometime later today or tomorrow as it comes through on their on their feed, please, please watch this show, please share it. And if you have gut issues and you don't live in Southern California, you do telemedicine. So which states are you licensed to do telemedicine in? That's a wonderful question. I am licensed in 21 different states. So if you want to see if I'm available to counsel you in your state, you can go to IOPBM and you'll find my name there. And it states all of the different states that I'm available in. Of the major states, I know I'm available in Texas, New York, and California, and several other states throughout the country. Let's see, you just disappeared. Hold on, let me put you back on. Okay, let's see. I think you're on one of the cameras. I don't know why you disappeared on. There we are. There we go. There you're back. Now, now you're on the cooking camera. 
that's so that's point. wonderful. So people can contact you and they can contact James as well. So you've got, everybody has all the social media handles. I'll put it up one more time. Um, Institute of Plant-Based Medicine um, on, on Instagram and Facebook and also iopbm.com and marriedtohealth.com and married to health on uh, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. So you are easy to find and people can see you and James or both of you and uh, deal with their deal with all of their gut health because really it's not how you were born. Our guts are, would you say, dynamic and they're always changing. Yeah. So if you have a gut that doesn't allow you to eat beans or legumes, you can probably do that as well. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Lisa Carlin, your host of Hey Doc with Food, Plants, and Medicine. And we'll be back. And we'll be back next week with Dr. Steve Wenda, who is Kaiser. Let me pull this one down. Um, a Kaiser. A Kaiser plant-based family practice doctor. So thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you again. Bye.